frameworks, day 19, Moses really does speak about Jesus. This is continuing the theme that we've been looking at for the last few days and particularly looks at those early books of the Bible and asks whether we can really identify God the Son walking around, speaking, interacting with his church in much the same way he does in the Gospels before he becomes a human being with this flesh, uh, this cursed flesh that is going to die. For them, people, it's contended in Moses, had a chance to speak with him and see him. And when Jesus refers back to those same characters, he speaks about them as people he has spoken with personally, not just people he knows about in some kind of omniscience uh, that we've put on to him. Striking as well to notice that there is something we've lost from the church down the centuries. The only way really that any of the early church began and spoke and taught about Jesus was through these books of the Bible that we're inclined to miss or inclined to not really read in favour of the Gospels or the Epistles. We notice something we've spot, spotted before that this character, Joshua, had his name changed to Joshua, Joshua in Hebrew. Um, I know well, and my parents very much chose this name, knowing it meant Yahweh saves. And of course, in Greek, it's Jesus. It's the same idea that uh, J is the shorthand for God's name, uh, the Lord's name, the one we write it, with the capital letters L-O-R-D in our English translations of the Bible. And then Shua means saves in Hebrew and Sus means saves in Greek. So we've got Jesus walking around with Moses and being the person who comes after Moses and who is the one who actually leads them to the final, well, the, the symbolic rest in the promised land, which of course wasn't the real thing. Uh, but when we read these books of the Bible with that framework, bits that were obscure and difficult to us suddenly start to make sense. And we notice similarities between those events and events where Jesus speaks to people in the Gospels. So did you notice the similarities in Jesus dealing, for example, with the Samaritan woman compared to Hagar in Genesis 16, a story that perhaps we don't pay much attention to? It's concerning Ishmael, one of those descendants of Abraham who actually wasn't part of the church or certainly wasn't part of that promise of the seed of Abraham who would bless the whole world. And yet we see this angel showing up with her. One of the discussions in the past turned on whether we can speak of the angel of the Lord, as he's referred to multiple times in this Genesis 16 passage, being the Lord Jesus. And Hagar actually teaches us how to understand the angel language in this part of the Bible by the way she speaks to him. It's very clear in the way she names the well in Genesis chapter 16, verse 14, or in the way she speaks about him before then in verse 13, seeing the one who sees her, or before that, the way he speaks to her. Her reaction says one thing, but even if her reaction is mistaken, the way this angel speaks, not as a herald of the living God, not saying, thus says the Lord, just speaking. This one who she can obviously see who comes to find her is doing what he has always done, revealing the God of heaven, the one who is unseen, as God from him. The quotation in Genesis 48 at the bottom of the page is very interesting as we reassess what our word angel really means in the Bible. Jacob speaks about the God who has been his shepherd all his life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm. May he bless these boys. He wants the blessing of the angel that he wrestled with the angel who he spoke with, who he met several times on his journey from his parents, Isaac and Rebecca, all the way through to Laban, 
working for him in Syria, fleeing from Esau. When we read those stories, seeing that Jesus is active and speaking to people and developing a personal relationship with them, just as we know he does with us, suddenly these books open up to us, become rich treasures for us to learn the character of this Lord Jesus in greater detail, really, and assuming less than in the Gospels. What do we make of this idea that actually the books that are most appropriate for people who don't know anything about Christianity to read, to understand what is true, are these first books of the Bible? That's how Jesus understands it. He says in the previous study, John 5, that if people don't listen to Moses, how are they going to understand anything he does? This ancient church father from the third century, Novation, in his writing on the Trinity, is incredibly contemporary. He addresses objections that we have had in our group about this very subject. And he addresses our objection as well about the idea of a created angel taking on the title of God and says that this angel of God is not like all the other angels of God. Therefore, though this passage is neither suited to the person of the father, lest he should be called an angel, nor to the person of an angel, lest he should be called God, yet it is suited to the person of Christ, that he should both be God, because he is the son of God, and should be an angel, this is a good definition of angel, because he is the announcer of the father's mind. So again, it blows open some of our categories, all the things we thought we knew, and replaces them with what Moses actually says. It was vital for people to understand it in the third century. It's even more vital for us to understand it now. So we don't go the way of these religious leaders in John 8, who think they know everything, who think they know all about the Messiah, and yet end up hating him when he's there standing in front of him. Let's not go their way. Let's pay attention to everything that these books of the Bible tell us about Jesus.